Welcome to Conversations. I'm Scott Turner, and our special guest today is Dr. Neil Murphy, President of the College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Neil, welcome to Conversations. We're really glad to have you oh, here. Oh, Scott, great to be here. So I thought that, uh, we well, we have an hour today, and so uh, mm -hmm. I thought that uh, we would uh, do what they do in novels. We'd start from the beginning, uh, <laughs> go to the middle of the present, and maybe then take a look into the future uh, by the end of our time together. So That sounds great. You, uh, you have a uh, remarkably... Uh, st stellar career in industry and uh, academia. Uh, you started at uh, Syracuse University as a graduate student, earned your PhD in chemistry there. Uh, had some rather prestigious uh, uh, fellowships there. You were a NASA fellow, NASA I, fellow. I believe. Yeah. And uh, and uh, uh, after graduating from Syracuse University with your doctoral degree, you went to work in industry at O'Brien and Gear. Uh, started not quite in the mailroom, but uh, almost, <laughs> and worked your way up to be president and uh, CEO of the company. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, then you decided to come to ESF, and uh, uh, that's a big transition, uh, which I hope we'll explore in a bit more detail later. But uh, uh, what motivated you to uh, go from that record of success at, at uh, Brian and Gear and decide to come to ESF to help us out here? Well, I, I, um, I have been very fortunate in my life through education and my uh, professional experience, and, and I really felt it. So. I, I had accomplished there what I really needed to accomplish. And uh, I felt that my colleagues needed a change from me, <laughs> and I definitely knew I needed a change from them. And just the thought to be able to contribute in a different way, particularly to give young people the opportunities, for example, help give them the opportunities of, that I had as, as I was a student and as I was growing into the profession. Mm -hmm. uh, so what were some of the, what were some of the, um, Things that uh, that 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 you you know you mentioned uh, being able to help young people and you know that's a that's a mm -hmm. very laudable goal but uh, um, there are lots of ways to do that besides coming and becoming the president of of a college you, you, you know what was going through your what was going through your mind I mean there 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 had to have been a, a pretty detailed thought process at work and uh, you know can you give us some well I uh, Scott I, I really think I've been. Even in my practice um, at, at O'Brien and Gear, my professional practice, I really largely focused on education as an important part of that. Whether I was out um, developing projects with clients and proposing things, that kind of thing, I always felt if I could leave a piece of knowledge with a prospective client, those clients would always come back and ask for more. Mm -hmm. And so uh, education was always a very strong piece of what I was trying to do. And, and I think, for me, it was just a logical extension of my focus on that. When I was at O'Brien & Gear, for example, I was the uh, editor of two textbooks. Uh, again, that, that sense that, that we had a responsibility to give the young people coming into the profession, had to share with them not only the technology, but also share with them the approach that is necessary for clients a better understanding of the applica applicability of regulations, all of that kind of thing. So uh, th that was it was always a strong piece. Mm -hmm. What were some of the projects you undertook at O'Brien and Gear that especially embodied that, that, that approach? Well, I, let me tell you about my first project okay. was. My first project was as a technician developing a uh, analytical protocol for measuring mercury in fish flesh in the sediments of Onondaga Lake. And that trend, that, that gradually moved into me taking responsibility for the Onondaga Lake Monitoring Program and getting out on the lake in midwinter and uh, the, the depths of the heat in August and the odors and so on from the lake going back into the 70s. And that, that was really the, the first piece of that. But then I moved more into industrial waste related issues. I moved into issues related to hazardous waste management and very frequently on hazardous waste management issues, you are thrust into a community to explain to the community the nature of the problem, but also to describe the remedy and how the remedy would, in, to a large measure, fix the problem. So again, that piece of education was, was very important. If you couldn't get the community uh, to trust that the remedy was gonna, was gonna succeed, then in many respects, uh, the remedy might not succeed. 
And so that was your first project. And uh, is that the one you're most proud of at uh, O'Brien? Oh, uh, there's a lot of them that I, I was really lucky to be involved with. I think very proud to be involved in the cleanup, for example, in Anacostia Creek in Washington, Rock Creek in Washington, the Potomac, very much involved in the cleanup of the Boston Harbor, involved in uh, the embayment, Rochester embayment of Lake Ontario, obviously Onondaga Lake with several upgrades to this, the Metropolitan Sewage Treatment Plant and coming up with the, the um, process design that will lead to a more effective treatment of even the waste generated here in, in Onondaga County. And I think being involved with some thousand uh, hazardous waste sites and, and uh, having the opportunity to, for, to develop corrective action, implement corrective action, and then frankly see the groundwater aquifer, for example, to be um, improved, to see that the soils were, were cleaned up to a point that um, further growth and development, the, the property itself could be used again for a constructive use. Those, those are all really good things. So when you were uh, engaging in this in this uh, in this uh, in this public process of, of persuasion, uh, mm -hmm. what what was the biggest educational challenge that you faced? I mean, what were what were some of the specifics of of, of the hurdles that you had to overcome to be able to, to to bring these these projects to fruition? Well, I think the biggest thing is always the language, the language of a practitioner in engineering in environmental science all in that area is not the same language that the public normally comprehends and understands. And so I think translating um, some of the engineering aspects, some of the, uh, some of the scientific aspects associated with, uh, with a hazardous waste remedy uh, was absolutely important to get it in a form that could be well understood by the public. Is there an example you can share with us for, for to put some kind of flesh on that, on that um, idea? Yeah, I can remember mm -hmm. going out to Lafayette, Indiana, and it was a TRW site. And corporate people from TRW definitely wanted to make sure that the mayor of the city of Lafayette understood that their wells were contaminated by some solvents that were largely, that had originated from TRW site. And I remember going out on the golf course because there was the mayor was on the golf course and uh, telling basically on the cor course, telling the mayor, um, this really isn't a major problem. And I remember the mayor asking me the basic question, if it's not a real problem, how come you're out here on the golf course on the 4th of July instead of being with your family? <laughs> and I thought he had a very, very good question yeah. as, a, as a counterpoint. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes you had to be involved with assisting in the disclosure of problems to mm -hmm. the public as a whole and to public officials that have a responsibility for their respective communities. So I guess uh, you being on the golf course on the 4th of July was evidence that it was a real serious problem then, wasn't it? It was, particularly yeah. kept having a suit on and a tie and that okay. kind of thing. <laughs> I, I stuck, a, stuck out definitely like a sore th thumb th compared to everybody else on that golf course. Yeah, Indiana in July, no less. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so the the the, uh, the 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 process of making the transition, you know, you made the point that it was a seamless uh, uh, transition in many ways, and that mm -hmm. there were aspects of education and and uh, implementation of policy and uh, those kind of things in both your career, O'Brien and Gear, O'Brien and Gear, and here, as well. Uh, but what was the, you know, how did you come to the attention of of the uh, people who were doing the hiring here at ESF? Uh, um, you know, did you notice any real differences? Did you have any trepidations about coming here? Uh, uh, can you share with us any of those well, I, sorts of things? Actually, it was um, my personal physician that first said, Neil, um, you should really think about a career at ESF. He happened to have uh, several of our existing faculty and research staff that were that he saw on a regular basis. And he said, I think it'd be a great place for you. Mm -hmm. It's really strange to say this started with the suggestion of my uh, personal physician. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really had no intrepidation. I mean, always when you go into a completely different setting, um, you're, there's always a sense of anticipation. But I remember the first day like it was yesterday. And I finished up at O'Brien and Gear on uh, it was a Friday afternoon, like at 
5.15 or 5.30. And we're packing up a box of stuff, basic stuff. And um, I walked in my office here at the college at 7 o'clock on Monday morning. And this is going to sound a little strange, but it took me 45 minutes to find the light switch. <laughs> it doesn't sound yeah. strange at all. <laughs> and the, the light switch was actually hidden behind one of the bookcases. <laughs> and you had to slide your hand behind the bookcase to flip the light switch on. The other strange thing about that first day is my first basic assignment was to go to New York City and I had to bring in a tux with me because it was to attend a formal event with uh, Audubon in New York City that evening, that Monday evening. Mm -hmm. So both of those really was an, represented an unusual way to start the, start the tenure here at, at ESF. But I do remember when I got back that late the next morning, they had moved the light switch from behind the, the bookcase into a very prominent location as you come in the room. Did Rayan help you with that transition? Did Ray, you? Ray himself helped me with everything. <laughs> I think she absolutely insisted that physical plant uh, move that switch. So. Mm -hmm. You had been involved with a college uh, as, as, a, as a member of the Board of Trustees or, or in an advisory role for some time before you came here, though, hadn't you? Yeah, Ross Whaley uh, had asked me probably four years before I even entertained the idea of, of potentially uh, following his footsteps. He had asked me to become a member of what I think it was called the President's Council. Yes, that's right. And it was a way to bring business people and others in the community to understand better the role of ESF and, and to help ESF to the extent that we could. And not only did I serve in that capacity, but I know I gave a number of guest lectures up here too, uh, particularly in, in the engineering uh, departments. So it was, I, I, had, I had a significant introduction. One of the uh, uh, really constructive things that you've done in the past 13 years here has been to to actually uh, uh, enhance the visibility of the college. Uh, you, you know, we've always been sort of uh, in the shadows of the orange sun over across the street, and, and there have been a number of uh, beneficial aspects to that relationship, but, uh, but, but, but also, you know, we weren't very well known. Uh, what made you decide to actually do something about that? Well, when I first met with our board of trustees, our board said, Neil, we want you to do two things. We want to raise, we want to have you actively involved in raising the visibility of the institution. And then secondly, we want you to put together a strategic plan and then execute it. And those are really the two principal things that, that I was directed by our board to do. Um, it was very easy to raise the profile. Uh, when you have quality faculty, you've got extraordinary students, you're doing, uh, as an institution, some, some really great research that has immediacy in terms of its, its impact on society and obviously the, the, uh, the global ecosystem. Once you have that base, it, it's very easy to move um, toward taking the, the um, putting a shine on the institution simply by getting what is being done in the institution out into the public. Why do you think we were suffering from a visibility problem, though? I, I mean, you know, you, what you say is correct. You know, we, we've had uh, we've had some world-class uh, research programs here. You know, the Wood Products uh, uh, a group, for example, was worldwide. I remember reading some of their work when I was in graduate school, for example, and and uh, and of course the the, uh, the the chemical ecology group. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there was yeah. there seemed to be no reason why why ESF should not have been in the forefront, but why is it that we sort of fell into the shadows, do you think? I, I don't n really understand why, um, other than maybe there just wasn't quite the emphasis on it. Um, and I agree with you, you know, the father of chemical ecology, clearly here at ESF, uh, a faculty member in polymer science and polymer chemistry, that won the Kyoto Prize. We've had a, an alum win the President's Technology Medal. We just had another alum win the, the Japan Medal, which is the corresponding thing to the President's Technology Medal. So, I mean, it was always here. And, um, and, and it was always a very, very high quality institution. It was just really letting the public and letting politicians and others understand the quality of the institution. Okay, well, uh, we'll pursue some broader aspects of, uh, of 
the culture of academia and industry and business uh, after the break. Uh, we're here with Neil Murphy, president of the College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Uh, we'll come back to conversations in a moment. Welcome back to Conversations. Our special guest today is Dr. Neil Murphy, president of the College of Environmental Science and Forestry. So Neil, um, uh, early on in my career, after I finished my PhD, um, I grievously insulted someone. Probably, and I, I know it's not the first time I've done this, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I was, uh, I was at the University of Cape Town at the time. I was a postdoctoral fellow, and, and uh, we were uh, having tea. They have morning tea there, a very civilized custom. And uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, professors sitting at the table was, uh, was ruminating about how wonderful it would be if academics ruled the world. And, uh, and I blurted out, as I often do, that I couldn't think of anything worse. Uh, the reason uh, I said that is that uh, academics, uh, of course, have a have a very unique culture. You know, it's uh, uh, we're always um, arguing with one another. We change our minds. We're contentious. Uh, uh, you know, that's 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 uh, that's makes academia um, kind of a refuge for contrarian people like like me, for example. But uh, the genius of the academic culture is that it serves a real societal need there. And of course, the culture of business and politics is 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 entirely different. It emphasizes teamwork. It emphasizes uh, cooperation. It emphasizes consensus. Uh, all those kind of things. And and uh, there are a lot of interesting conflicts that uh, arise when you try to meld the business political culture with the academic culture. Uh, mostly we muddle our way through pretty well, but uh, uh, I'd like to explore with you a little bit about uh, some of the challenges that you faced in, in, in trying to uh, uh, bring your expertise and uh, the culture that you grew up in to the academic culture at ESF. Have you encountered any challenges or have uh, any thoughts about that? I mean, the, the challenge is with myself. It, it wasn't with the institution. You know, I, I had to adjust or try to adjust my pace, pace and decision making and those kinds of things to the, to the needs of the institution. Um, for me, I think the most difficult thing to learn, uh, and it, it at least took me uh, two years to really learn it, and I'm still learning it today, is the whole thing about um, Academic governance, and um, and I and I clearly understand the reason for it today. No individual should have an impact on the body of knowledge that's being taught. No single individual. It involves everybody to make decisions about that body of knowledge. But that was a difficult lesson for me to learn. And it, it uh, I remember it was uh, it took a lot of thinking about it, a lot of engagement, that kind of thing. But I'm today. I'm a very, very strong advocate of it, mm -hmm. uh, and that is different than, and it leads. It, it's a different kind of process in a business setting in terms of making certain decisions. You know, in, in a business process, um, I could make a decision in eight hours, or make a decision in two hours, or something like that in terms of moving direction and making adjustments to the organization, that kind of thing, and. Here, the nature of, of the academy is the is collaboration in making those decisions and drawing in as much of the institution as possible into making those kinds of decisions. So that was a big thing for me to learn. So uh, I wasn't quite clear on on, on on what you said when when you said no one individual should have control over the over the, the teaching or things like that. But yeah. by by that, did you mean that, uh, that that someone in your position, for example, someone who's in a responsible position in, admi in administration, should Absolutely. should have that power? Yeah, it, yeah it because, shouldn't have that power. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's that's no question about it. Yeah, that's 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 something that I am very sympathetic with. Uh, clearly, uh, but uh, you know, Bob Bob Fry, who who used to be the uh, dean of students here, mm -hmm. you know, was once once uh, um, uh, uh, compared being someone uh, compared someone in his position with someone who had to be a herder of cats, to use the old uh, the, the the old uh, the old phrase, and and. Uh, and you must have encountered uh, uh, something like this as well. You indicated that it was a learning curve for you when you came here. Yeah, I, I would never refer to the 
to the process of herding cats. He said it very affectionately, by the way. <laughs> Did he really? No one took I, offense by it. We all had never, a good laugh I over it. Say but that, but yeah, yeah. I, I would say yeah. um, the necessary collaboration simply requires more time, requires more dialogue, requires more engagement, mm -hmm. uh, consensus building, those kinds of things. So it, it requires time to make certain types of decisions. And uh, so I think somebody has to be patient First has to understand the process, then has to have the patience to allow the process to, to move forward the way it should move forward. Yeah. What areas do you think uh, uh, consensus is important and, and what areas uh, do you think you should not try to achieve consensus? You know, you know, when, I, when I hear someone talking about consensus, you know, it seems to me that there are certain areas where, where, where that kind of thing is important. You need to make a decision on, on some aspects of, of, uh, of how you run things here. But there are other places where you should never expect consensus to show up. Uh, and, and, and this is getting to the heart of what, I'm, what, what, I, what I was trying to get across with my anecdote at the beginning. You know, you know academics are contrarian people. You know, they, 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 they often uh, change their minds very quickly. And how do you mobilize that kind of thing for the obvious uh, uh, public benefits that taxpayers should be able to expect from a place like this without compromising that essential uh, contrarian nature of the academic environment. Well, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize um, all academicians or all faculty as being contrarian. I think they have personalities that generally reflect the personality of, of society as a whole. And my own situation prior to coming to the college, I mean, we had our principal engineers that that. Uh, were, were very, could be very self-focused at times and sometimes may not be able to see some of the other peripheral issues and how those issues bared on, on their practice. Um, so I, I've, I've, you know, there are strong-willed people and there, there are, are people that are optimistic. There are people that tend to be a little bit more contrarian in view and, and it's really a mesh of, of those styles and those interests and those characteristics of people. I see, I think you have quite a bit of that um, in certain types of businesses, particularly in the consulting kind of area, whether it be science or whether it be engineering, um, as, as almost as much as what you have in an uh, academic institution. Because again, you have well-trained technical people in those, con in those consulting areas as, as you have very well-trained uh, people here at the college. Uh, so for me, it, 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 to, to be used to some of that was, was um, I was used to some of that, but maybe not to the extent that I realized the tools of patience and the tools of uh, consensus building were needed here at ESF. So from your perspective of being both in industry and now after 13 years as an academic president, you actually don't see that much of a difference in culture. I, I don't today. Yeah, okay. I really don't. That's interesting. But the only thing I really do see is the, is the speed of making decisions. That, that, that is, that's significantly different. Um, I don't want you to mention anything that you feel uncomfortable with, but uh, again, let's try to put some flesh and bones on, on, on this. What, what was your, uh, uh, would you care to share any experiences on, 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 on how you managed to achieve a, 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 a tangible goal in the face of this, this, uh, this kind of swarm of, 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 of people who are the core of this institution? Well, I, I think putting the uh, strategic plan together. Yeah. I think uh, there were contrarians to say, look, we've done this in the past and we're skeptical that anything is going to come out of this process. And I, I remember speaking quite a bit, if you put the time and energy into this, I guarantee you things will come out of the process. And that took a while. Um, you know, we, we were in the process of developing this strategic plan for almost 18 months. And uh, so it took a lot of patience, but, but again, people moved. Uh, they developed consensus on certain things, even our physical facilities. And we've, we've changed our physical facilities significantly over the last 13 years. People came to consensus in terms of what we needed. Again, it, it took a while to get there, but, but people did. And I think even as there were ideas about new majors, um, 
the whole idea of developing maybe an educational program for non-traditional learners that we're doing more today than, than what we were doing 13 years ago in that area. I think the importance of fundraising, uh, you know, our foundation has grown substantially and, and increasingly we have faculty uh, integrated into, into some of those fundraising activities and developing concepts. So I, I think that uh, the biggest thing was develop that, that, that image or picture for the future, try and get as many people involved in, in painting that picture, and then get them involved in actually then helping to move us in that direction. Yeah. In your uh, Huffington Post blog and, and uh, in many of the, the pieces that you've contributed to the Post Standard here locally, mm -hmm. you, you, you've, you've addressed some pretty uh, broad issues of, of, of science and public policy mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, among those are what do we do about climate change, what do we do about energy use. Uh, you've, you've, uh, you've written before about the need to make a transition to a, to a carbon-free economy. And um, uh, and you know my 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 question is 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 that is that when you go to recommend policy to legislators, you know, you have to have some clear picture of of of, of what it is you're recommending. But but uh, you know certainly in some of these broad issues of of energy use and and uh, especially climate change and, and and those sorts of things. There's a lot of uncertainty there scientifically, and 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 uh, a lot of questions that need to be um, need to be uh, addressed with some actual specific answers before we can start recommending policy. How do you think we're doing on that? I, I think we're making progress. Um, you know, if you look at the peer-reviewed publications relative to climate change. I think you'll find that approximately 98% of them uh, are supportive that humankind are influencing our climate. I, th I think if there is any degree of uncertainty is, is to what extent we are versus other factors. And I think the other area of uncertainty is what is our climate going to really look like by the year 2100? And there are six or eight modeling houses that are focused on that particular issue in terms of the issue about what is things going to look like at tw by 2100 under different scenarios. Scenario that we don't change how we use carbon-based uh, fuels, um, situations where we do change um, our behavior and we adopt a strategy for more uh, carbon-less base, less uh, for, for energy. Um, and those models are increasingly converging rather than diverging. And they, they, they increasingly are telling a very similar story. They're still not yet definitively predictive. I mean, those models can never predict what happened with Superstorm Sandy or Super Snowstorm Nemo or Hurricane Irene, Tropical Storm Lee. You know, they, they can never predict a specific activity. But we're definitely seeing the evidence. Uh, last year, if I remember correctly, we had 12 storms in the U.S. <clears throat> that contributed greater than a billion dollars of damage. And that was un that's unheard of, unheard of. And when you think about it, you know, for every one degree increase in temperature of the atmosphere, we can hold 7% more moisture. And f with every increase of that, uh, that moisture, we just create more instability in our climate, um, and, I, and I think I think people are beginning to understand that. I, th I think when you have the um, governor of New Jersey starting to cr scratch his head now as to whether cl the humankind's impact on climate is really impacting his state, you know, he's 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 I think asking some very serious questions of himself. When you have the governor of New York, you have the mayor of New York City, you have the governor of of, of Connecticut, all saying. We've got to do something about this because our our uh, our communities and our citizens increasingly are at risk. That's that's a that's that 
that illustrates a very important point to this whole issue, which is that there are whole political and economic dimensions to, to this, as well as scientific. And, and, and uh, you know, th I don't have to tell you about the turmoil that's raging around the, the, the climate change debate, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the people talking past each other, for example, yeah. uh, uh, selective uh, um, uh, uh, cherry picking of data to, to advocate a particular cause. And, 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 and this is, this is getting to the heart of the question. You know, you, you know, academia is uh, is is supposed to be an environment that's uh, that's insulated mm -hmm. from that. You know, that's yeah. the only way that we can function uh, properly to fulfill what our unique social role is. And yet, there are huge political forces, economic forces, and those kind of things that 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 are asking us to do something that. I'm not sure that we can give them, which is certainty and predictions, and 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 our role should be to be skeptical, to be mm -hmm. to be tentative, to be uh, willing to change our minds, and that doesn't always fill the need. And and the concern is that is that to what extent are those political forces going to come in and make us something that we maybe should not be? Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. um, there was a recent. I'm trying to remember how long ago, but there was a recent editorial piece in Science. And um, the focus of it was the responsibility of scientists to be, to be active in, in engaging in uh, forming and suggesting public policy. And I, I think that in, as a body, I think scientists have been too passive in that area. I think there are in, in almost every area, every arena, you're absolutely right, Scott, that there are different views and that kind of thing. But, but I think there's some generally accepted um, consensus on certain things. And I think the body of scientists need to be more vocal on those things to, to the, in educating the public as a whole, but then also presenting their case to policymakers. I, I, think, I think we could do a better job. Okay. Uh, we're here with uh, Dr. Neil Murphy, uh, President of the College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Uh, we'll come back to more conversations with Neil in a moment. Welcome back to Conversations and our final segment with Dr. Neil Murphy. Neil, uh, we had a fascinating discussion about the interface between the public and the unique role of the university, and, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, one of the major uh, things that we as a social institution do is education. Uh, that's been a theme in your work at uh, O'Brien and Gear. It's been a theme in your decision to come to here at ESF, and 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 like the energy industry, which is undergoing tremendous upheaval due to new technologies and those kind of things. The same thing can be said for the industry of education, so Absolutely. to speak. You know, you know, we've been we've been operating on a business model that involves uh, uh, charging students to come here and sit in a room with us and and have us uh, and have us lecture uh, to them, talk to them. That's our that's our mode of content delivery. And as uh, newspapers and uh, broadcast media are discovering, uh, uh, that model doesn't work anymore. It's not a money making model anymore. And uh, and I've seen um, uh, estimates of of what's going to be happening. Uh, uh, as the online revolution comes to education, you know there have mm -hmm. been some alarmist uh, uh, predictions that as, as many as half the colleges and universities in the United States will probably be closed or bankrupt by 2050. And that's a major challenge for education, and, and this has been a common theme in everything that you've done. How do you see this playing out over the next, uh, over the next 20 years or so? What do you think is the future of, of a place like ESF in the online world? Well, I, I, I view that um, online education has, has the best benefit to non-traditional students. Students that um, they are looking to either advance their education or looking to move in a slightly different direction. And they have, they have uh, families, they have jobs, they have all those kinds of things. I also think where our students, for example, may in the summer be in the field, whether they're in Namibia or whether they're on an island off the coast of Maine, the ability for them, for example, in the evening where there may not be other things going on, uh, 
to get online and maybe satisfy a requirement either in an area of real interest to them or a general education requirement and that kind of thing, I think that's fantastic. But what we're seeing with young people today that are, that are coming to higher education it are young people that have a wide range of, of different uh, problems. Um, and one of the things we, we're always looking for is students under, under duress. And uh, there's nothing like the socialization uh, of, of a college campus to really melt people together, to allow people to personally grow as people, not just as scientists or engineers. And that experience I, d I don't think will ever, will ever go away. Uh, I'm very pleased about what we do here because we're, our education is not limited to the lecture hall. It's not limited to the laboratory. Now, there's a strong focus on experiential learning where the real synthesis opportunity is out in the field. Whether, whether it be in Namibia or whether it be a Cranberry Lake, um, to give those opportunities to students where they really are, are put in a position where they have to take what they've, what they've learned and apply it. You can never do that, in my opinion, using distance learning. This is one of the major challenges that, that this institution, I think, is going to be facing. You know, you know, we have always prided ourselves in the quality of our undergraduate education and, and, and in the intimacy of the, of the relationship between professor and student. And, and uh, uh, at the same time, economically, you know, we're going to be facing competition uh, from lots of other, other uh, uh, places that may not offer an education that we would like to give, but that uh, that will be uh, attractive to a broader range of students. You know, and 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 so. There's some real um, issues besides the socialization related to quality of education, related to to uh, the ability of, of of professors and students to engage in spontaneous kinds of uh, kinds of learning experiences that 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 somehow are going to have to be built into this new competitive world that's 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 going to be quite challenging for us. So, do you have any thoughts on on how we manage that that, well, that sort I, of I, transition? I, 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 th I, th I think there is an opportunity to use hybrid methods, hybrid methods whereby there may be some content that would be available on a MOOC or whatever that could be integrated into a lecture. Um, and so I, I think that there is an opportunity for hybrid programs, uh, particularly for programs that either are very specialized or programs that may be more focused on general education. But, you know, I see these young people grow up over four years, and they're transformed as young people. I mean, the skills that they have at the end of four years, in my mind, are extraordinary. When I go to Capstone, uh, it, you know, experiences where they have to stand up and they have to describe what the research was and what they learned from it and how it applies to society as a whole, um, it, it's compelling. I mean, it, it is it's dramatic. Because uh, I, always, I always ask the question myself internally, could I have done that when I was their age? And many times, Scott, the answer to that question is no. And I know these young people, they find themselves here, they find their mission, they, they know what they come out of here knowing what they want to do with their life. Um, I can remember a young woman who was with you as a student in Namibia, and she was, she was going on to law school. And uh, she decided that based on what she experienced in Namibia, that more knowledge had to be developed about that and about the systems as a whole. And she's, I believe, finished her graduate work at Michigan in environmental paleontology, I think it was. Mm -hmm. that, that individual was transformed as, as, as an individual, you know, that young lady. And we have incredible pe young people that, that go through that, that process. I remember talking to a young man, his name was Jeff Dupuy, and he was doing some community service. And I remember going to a middle school down in the south, south side of Syracuse, and uh, it was Shea Middle School. And he was helping to give young people a passion for science and helping the teachers to do that after the normal school day. And the kids were around him like an amoeba, classically kids playing soccer, and. You know, the kids are all focusing on, on Jeff. And I remember going up to him afterwards and I said, Jeff, 
I understand exactly what you're doing to help these young people. You know, you're transforming their perception about life. You know, some of them, life is 10 city blocks in a convenience store. You're showing them life. There are no bounds on life. I know you're what you're giving them. What are they giving to you? He said, I know what I want to do in my life. I want to teach. Those, you can never get that in distance learning. You can never get that off an offering on a MOOC. It just, it's not, it's not possible. Our, our um, businesses, there was the Chronicle of Higher Education did a survey of, of the, the business world and how they valued education. And they, uh, they looked at a bachelor's degree um, that was awarded through distance learning, asynchronous learning. They looked at liberal arts degree um, through a liberal arts institution. They looked at a bachelor's degree through uh, a research institution. And on a score of zero to four, they valued a distance learning a degree at a 2.67. And they valued a bachelor's degree from a research institution at like a 3.5 or 3.6. So even employers are saying that from their perspective, having these opportunities to grow, having these opportunities to, for teamwork, having these opportunities to, as we talked earlier about contrarian views and consensus building and all those kinds of things, that, and, and the, the opportunity for exploration is so important it, that you tend not to get that with, a, with, with an asynchronous award, um, awarded degree. Yeah, the challenges of, of online education are, 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 are clear and, and, and you stated them uh, mm -hmm. very well. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the, but we, we, we run up against always with, with, uh, with, with the model that we have here right now, we run up against the issue of limits, and, and uh, especially for an institution like ESF, where we're dedicated to, to problems that are global in scope. Uh, uh, somehow we have to be able to solve that, that problem. We have to be able to escape an area of brick and mortar limits and extend our mission to say people in Africa or people in India oh, or or Asia and, and 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 bringing them here is unrealistic. Not only will they not be able to afford it, but uh, but but we don't have the capacity for them here. Mm -hmm. and, and so and so there have to be some creative ways of 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 of, of dealing with that and 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 preserving the kinds of positive things that you're that you're that you're talking about. And mm -hmm. I have to admit, I have no idea how to do it. I have some thoughts. Uh, but uh, have you given any thought about how yeah, we extend I, our reach internationally I, to, to st people who might need it the most? I, any great opportunity to be yeah. a post-baccalaureate certificate. Mm -hmm. Again, I think there's tremendous opportunity there. And we're actually doing that in this area of um, applications of coatings using ultraviolet light and electron beam technology. Um, I think that serv a survey course to draw the interest of, of a young person or a more mature person uh, we have a distance learning course that I know that we put together. I think it's a one credit and we put together three credit that is both uh, renewable energy, climate change, uh, conventional energy sources, that, that kind of an area that was funded by NASA that I know that we've reached a lot of people using the deli the, through the delivery of that content in distance learning. But, but it, it's, not, it's not at the heart of a true educational system. It's, it's an opportunity for an individual to explore, mm -hmm. but to really immerse themselves into something that they have a strong degree of interest. They need to have a residential experience. I remember my dad, um, I, I frequently say, my dad was a research chemist, worked for, uh, uh, during the most of my time growing up, worked for GE and Schenectady in, in the area of applied research. And I remember him bringing home a single stack phosphoric acid fuel cell that drove, I think, a two watt light bulb <laughs> on the kitchen table. And I frequently say that, that I, I drew my passion for both science and engineering, not in the lecture hall, not in the lab, but on the kitchen table. Um, because he would do those kinds of things. That's what you and your colleagues do with our students also. You provide them those unique things that, that sort of brings everything together and or 
that excites them, that, that creates a, uh, for them a new dimension that, that you can't, you simply can't get through, through uh, an electronic delivery of content. So suppose we have a student in Namibia, for example, and mm -hmm. we want to give them that kind of experience. You know, they, we, we, we've, we've piqued their interest with an online offering, for example. We want to give them that experiential uh, experience, uh, experiential learning. How do we do that? Do we send us to them, for example? I think, I think that's where we have to start. Mm -hmm. We have to start by, by having us go to them and, and to, to make sure that that first of all, that their passion is something that we can deliver to, to meet the expectations of their passion, that we can maybe elevate their passion for, mm -hmm. for uh, further exploration in a given area. Yeah. I, think, I think we always have to reach out. Um, but I think the best opportunity for, for that individual is to, is to be in a collective body of people that come from different backgrounds, come from different uh, different si environmental systems, different geographic systems, different political systems, and to get the synergy and learning that's associated with that kind of diversity. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be something that we'll be developing in the future, uh, but what's in your future now? <laughs> you know, Scott, this, this is something that a lot of people are asking me, <laughs> and uh, I typically have said I'll, I'll focus on that after Labor Day, but I would definitely like to uh, still be affiliated with the college for some period of time, and I don't know what that is. Probably my successor should determine that. Um, but to help out in some special projects and maybe teach a course, that kind of thing, and, and make some contributions in different kinds of ways. Do you have any special projects uh, in mind that you can tell us about? Well, a good friend of mine, who's become a very good friend, is, is uh, Commissioner of New York State DEC, Joe Martens. And he, and as well as some of his division directors, who I equally know quite well, have, have some degree of concern that uh, the special relationship we have with DEC and supporting their mission, that we may lose that if there's a change in leadership. And so I made a commitment to the commissioner that one of my special projects would be to go down to Albany at least once a month and, and talk to them about what we are doing, what we can do better, and how we can better support the department in meeting the, their responsibility in protecting the unique environmental resources in New York State. But that, that's just one okay. little one. Yeah. And what are you going to miss most about being president of USF? First and foremost, the students. I, I tell people very frequently that I'll take a walk down to the snack bar to get another cup of coffee, not because I need a cup of coffee, but because I've got to run into some students and say hi mm -hmm. and get re-energized by their optimism, their, their folk, incredible focus on, on life and that kind of thing. It lifts me up. I can go back. I can do some more paperwork when, I, when they lift me up. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. And you're not going to miss being dunked every year. And so. I, if, <laughs> right. if, if, if students want to dunk me, I'll, I'll do it any day. I'll, I'll largely do what they want me to do because they're special and they drive this institution in some incredible ways. You know. Secondly, I'm going to miss the the friendship of my colleagues, both my colleagues as part of the faculty, but also my colleagues that are part of our staff. And I mean, I'm going to miss the grounds crew because I, whenever I come in, I tend to come in very early in the morning, anywhere from quarter to seven to seven o'clock. Usually, the first person I meet is somebody from the grounds crew, and I'll stop and we'll talk for two or three or four minutes and that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. So all those kinds of things I'm going to miss. Yeah. Well, ESF is a much different institution uh, than it was 13 years ago when you came on board as our president. Neil, thank you for joining us uh, today and uh, uh, for conversations. This is uh, Scott Turner. We've had an hour-long uh, interesting discussion with uh, Neil Murphy, who has been president of the College of Environmental Science and Forestry and will soon be leaving us. Uh, Neil, thank you very much for joining us. Scott, thank you. Appreciate it. I really enjoyed it. Me too. Good day. As my colleagues know, I can never leave this podium with you there without sharing an Irish blessing. So may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again,
This is difficult. May God hold you in the palm of his hand. Great group of young people, we're going to miss you. Go forth, make your own mark, and make us proud. Congratulations. Congratulations.